welcome or welcome back to our weekly uh, series of pop-up exhibitions that can sometimes turn into actual seminars. Uh, the idea of the series, which meets every Wednesday at noon during the semesters, so we're starting now in the spring semester, uh, is to connect speakers from both campus and the community with objects and art from the Madison collection. And the, the connection can sometimes be just sort of like a chance encounter or something that really was meant to be, uh, you know, in the, in the stars, in the constellations. And sometimes, sometimes a little bit of both. Um, it's a pleasure and honor with the final kinds of words to welcome today's speaker, uh, Professor Martin Jay, Professor, Irma, Professor of History at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, has been a professor here for two decades. So, so, so Wikipedia tells us. Uh, a fundamental link between uh, us and the Frankfurt School, a direct link between us and the Frankfurt School. Uh, on, a, on a very personal note, his name rings in Italian as Immaginazione Dialettica, the, the, the Italian title of uh, uh, what was his dissertation and became a fundamental study on the history and development of the Frankfurt School, but also a historian of uh, German intellectual migration to the United States, and uh, also a deep thinker about uh, the politics and the intellectual politics of vision. Uh, and it's a great opportunity to bring some of his uh, many sides as an intellectual today in speaking about uh, the painting that we have here on display. And then it's now, since this spring, it's on permanent display uh, in the Magnus collection. So we took it out of the, the cases where it's now visible to every day to, to our visitors. And, and we displayed it here to really focus to zero and on, on this image and on its uh, on its contest through, through today's talk. Max Lieberman, who spent a considerable amount of time of his life painting his garden in, in a villa on the, by the Banze uh, near the, the city center of Berlin. And, um, and this is probably one, one really one of the most important uh, paintings, artworks in the Magnus collection and uh, one of the most distinguished intellectuals on our campus meeting uh, together really uh, close by. There's a little bit of a like, same case between you and, and the painting, but it's not, it's just to protect you both, <laughs> to, to make sure that you both uh, perform uh, today. It's really an honor to have Martin as a, as a speaker today. We're all looking forward to learning all the contours uh, of this painting, so expanding its frame. In, in all kinds of ways, so please join me in welcoming my Thanks very much, Francesca, for that gracious introduction. Everybody can hear, uh, not too loud, not too soft. Uh, Francesco asked me to, um, uh, to choose an object from that extraordinary book, The Jewish World, uh, which uh, I'm sure a number of you know, a book which consists of uh, images of objects from the collection here. And most of them, I must say, ritual objects, older objects uh, from cultures that I know scarcely anything about, uh, uh, gave me an enormous sense of, uh, uh, of terror. So this is, I knew scarcely anything about any of them. Until finally, I came to this image. Uh, and I had an immediate, uh, immediate moment of recognition because although I'd never seen this particular painting, I knew the garden. Uh, the garden I had actually seen, not the painting, but the object in it. Um, and in a way, what I want to do today is to contextualize that moment by telling you what I suppose we could call a tale of three uh, villas. Uh, the first one uh, is in uh, Berlin. Uh, in, uh, well, first of all, let me, let me show you our hero, uh, Max Liebermann, a self-portrait. He often painted himself, painted many other portraits. A uh, typical, I would say, bourgeois painter with a suit on, you don't see that very often, but uh, an image from 1912. All right, the first villa. This is the Hans Arnold Center uh, on the banks of the Banze uh, in the westernmost part of the city of Berlin. Uh, this is a villa that was originally, uh, 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 originally built in the 1920s and then uh, owned by a German banker named Hans Arnold. During the war, the Nazis took it over. After the war, then I'll go through all the details, it became the home of the American Academy uh, in Berlin. And in the year 2010, my wife, Kathy Gallagher, and I were 
uh, lucky enough to be fellows at the American Academy. And here you see it looking from the Bonsai, from the lake, to the back of the villa, and you see people uh, very sort of socially uh, interacting uh, on the, uh, the terrace of the villa. Very typical uh, of these grand villas at the banks of the Bonsai. The Bonsai, as I'm sure many of you know, is one of a series of lakes in the western part of the city. Um, the area is, is uh, fraught with historical significance, and those of you who saw the movie Bridge of Sighs will know that the uh, Galenica Bridge is the bridge very close by to the Bonsai. Uh, where spies were exchanged during the Cold War. Uh, the uh, line between uh, Berlin, West Berlin, and East Germany ran through the Bonsai uh, at this time the bridge uh, crossed. So this uh, itself was historically uh, a significant building. Uh, Arnold uh, from the banking family, his uh, uncle was Edward Arnold, also an extraordinarily important uh, German-Jewish businessman who gave the Villa Massimo in Rome to the American Academy in Rome. So these were people who were uh, wealthy, but also patrons of the arts. So we were lucky enough uh, to spend uh, six months uh, as fellows at the Academy. But what's fascinating is that it's only one of three villas that I'm going to be talking about around the Bonsai, the second of which, just around the other side of the lake, uh, has a much more uh, sinister uh, history. Uh, this is the villa, originally uh, owned by a man named Minou, who was a uh, very right-wing uh, figure in the Weimar Republic, in fact, in there had been a meeting between uh, General von Ludendorff and Hans uh, von Seyck uh, to discuss the possible coup d'etat against the Myanmar Republic that take place. But in any event, uh, Minou was a very right-wing figure. Uh, in the late 1930s, during the Nazi period, he uh, was uh, jailed for uh, embezzlement. And the villa then became available for purchase, and it was purchased by uh, the SS, uh, apparently Goebbels wanted it, but uh, Lionel Heinrich was able to uh, gain uh, possession of it. And then uh, in uh, early 1942, January 20th, the infamous conference uh, presided over by Heinrich, including 15 uh, high officials in the Nazi government, uh, among them Otto Eichmann, uh, planned uh, the Holocaust. Uh, the final solution was planned in this very building, just across the lake uh, from. Uh, the uh, American Academy. And you can go down and see the historical uh, account. It's a very moving, very troubling building. Uh, and it's now, of course, uh, a memorial to the victims. A third villa, a third villa, uh, just down the road, uh, also on that side of the Bonsai, was the house built uh, in the early part of the 20th century for uh, Max Lieberman. So the Lieberman villa is very, very close to the Bonsai conference building. And this is one image of it. This is the front of the villa with uh, part of the garden in front. We'll talk about the garden quite a bit. Um, this underwent uh, a very complicated history as well. In 2006, it was reclaimed for the Lieberman Foundation. And now you can see many of the pictures that he owned, many pictures by him, including quite a number of these garden pictures in the villa. Uh, in uh, a number of ways, this is really quite a striking testament uh, to the enduring power of Lieberman as a uh, important uh, cultural figure, uh, German Jewish figure uh, in the uh, Weimar Republic uh, and uh, afterwards. These are images of the same villa from the other side. Um, this is looking from the Bonsai back towards the house. You see the gardens uh, that I'll be talking about, uh, the flowers and the hedges and the trees around them. And this is looking from the house towards the Bonsai. You see the Bonsai very close by. Sailboats. Uh, it was a place for leisure. There was a beach that was set up in 96. Uh, people from Berlin could go out uh, from the city and uh, enjoy a respite from uh, Berlin's uh, uh, rather hectic life. So the Bonsai had lots of these quite wonderful bills. Most of them spared, by the way, uh, during the Second World War because the bombing of Berlin did not take place this far west in residential areas. Now, who was Max Lieberman? Uh, who is the man who came to own the villa we've been looking at here, came to paint the painting we're talking about today? Uh, Lieberman was born in 1847. His father, Louis Lieberman, was an extraordinarily wealthy, uh, basically cotton merchant. Uh, he branched out into other uh, areas uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, commerce and uh, industry and uh, made his mark uh, in the Wilhelmian period and uh, was an extraordinarily uh, powerful figure in that world. Uh, German-Jewish uh, 
finance, uh, business, uh, and uh, as we'll see, uh, also culture. I mentioned uh, uh, Edward Arkell, they were friends, and many others, uh, Blackbird, and there's some Blackbird in the uh, financier who was Bismarck's uh, banking and so forth. A very interesting moment in the history of German Jewish relations, especially after uh, 1871 when the uh, Kaiserreich uh, became uh, established and the German Jews had the possibility of expanding their role as never before. Now, as often is the case with uh, wealthy families, families who make their money in finance or industry, the children become aesthetically uh, active. Uh, you know, Ludenbrook's the great novel by Thomas Mann deals with that trajectory. And the son, uh, born in 1847, uh, Max Lieberman, uh, was uh, a talented artist, uh, studied uh, in uh, Germany, and then went for five years to uh, France, studied with the Barbizon School, right outside of Paris, uh, the school that was associated with Millet and Theodore Rousseau. They went to Holland for a while, studied with Joseph Israels, actually a Jewish painter uh, in uh, Holland, uh, and then came back to Germany uh, in uh, the 1880s. Now, I don't want to go through the entire uh, history, but just to give you a sense of his early work, this is a painting from 1886, a painting which uh, is more or less in the realist style that was then made popular by uh, Ron Weibel and, uh, most importantly, on a uh, What's interesting about this particular uh, type of painting, there's a number of other scenes of this kind, uh, these are fairly modest uh, people. These are women working in a kind of artisanal factory. Uh, spinning uh, cloth. Um, they're shown in a way that doesn't idealize them. This is not a great uh, sort of mythical or historically important painting. It's a painting of people who were just simply common people. Uh, and often this kind of painting is damned as uh, Arnold like uh, Mattafi, the painting of poor people. Because most of the uh, images that were painted during this period in Germany and elsewhere for that matter were people of higher social status, mythological or religious importance. And realism, among other things, uh, you think of Corbet and Millet, for example, in France, often painted uh, people of more modest backgrounds. And so this was typical of the work that he did uh, until a move that he made, we'll talk about this in a moment, towards uh, Impressionism. Uh, in the period he went to France, uh, Impressionism had emerged in 1863, as often seen as the founding moment uh, with uh, Manet's de Jeunet Soler. And uh, he quickly absorbed uh, some of the currents. And his own painting began to, um, in a way, translate the French into the German medium, something that is extraordinarily uh, fraught during uh, the 1870s and 80s, when France was still very much uh, construed as an enemy of Germany. Uh, as an Impressionist, uh, his style, in a way, was, I think we have to be frank, derivative. Uh, he doesn't quite have the experimental uh, instincts of some of his French uh, models. So the colors are somewhat muted, uh, the palette is not as, uh, as bright, uh, the pastels are not as uh, clear, the, uh, uh, the uh, use of form and uh, line is still more traditional. He doesn't use color to create uh, space to the extent that some of his impressions will. But nonetheless, uh, the rough brush strokes and uh, a sense of ephemerality which uh, mark the impressions is something that uh, he himself absorbed. Uh, in Germany, uh, Impressionism was a very controversial import, largely because it was seen as coming from the outside, as something that was not German. And painters like uh, Menzel and others who painted, uh, say, the great historical scenes of Frederick the Great, uh, eschewed a, an expression, uh, an Impressionist style. Uh, some of his uh, more intimate paintings, Menzel, uh, perhaps had Impressionist uh, touches, but by and large, the great. Uh, Historical paintings were fairly uh, realistic uh, in their, uh, in their uh, uh, formal uh, qualities. Now, because of the cosmopolitan quality of Impressionism, because of its being an import from France, uh, and because a number of the people who were involved in importing it happened to be Jews, uh, the Salon, for example, of Carl and Francis Bernstein, very important collecting some of the paintings. Uh, later, uh, the figures of uh, Paul and uh, Bruno Cassira, uh, who were uh, dealers in art and uh, involved in a number of different enterprises and institutions. There was a quality, even though many of the Impressionists, uh, uh, besides uh, Lieberman, people like Lovis Korn or Max uh, Slaykov, who were not Jewish, 
Uh, impressions were seen as somehow a complicated way of uh, a Jewish import. And we have evidence of the direct anti-Semitic attacks on Lieberman and impressionism in a number of different uh, places uh, in the uh, period of the 1880s, 90s, uh, even into the 20th century. Was Lieberman Jewish? Uh, to what extent was Lieberman a Jewish painter? It's very difficult to talk about uh, as if there was an essence of being a Jewish painter. We know that Max Lieberman was indeed identified as a Jew, self-identified as a Jew, not terribly religious, uh, not terribly um, interested in Zionism at the time. Uh, a German Jew who thought that it was possible to create uh, a place for uh, Jews in the new Germany of the Kaiserreich. Uh, the famous um, piece in the Kunstwerk of uh, 1912 uh, by Moritz Goldstein, the Jew German Jewish Parnassus, dealt with this growth of a symbiosis between Germans and Jews, not without its problems, but nonetheless one that was understood to be uh, a positive development. And Liebman, I think, uh, was very much in that uh, mold. Uh, a, a German uh, before, in a way, he was a Jew, but a Jew nonetheless. Celebrating Christmas, yes. Uh, enthusiastic about the war in 1914, yes. A uh, German patriot, yes. All of those things uh, that German Jews themselves thought would in a way, allow assimilation. Now, there was, however, one episode early in his career. Uh, it was painted in 1879 for an exhibition, an international exhibition in Munich. Uh, and the subject of the painting uh, was uh, uh, the young Jesus, 12 year old Jesus, talking. Uh, to Jewish elders uh, in a temple. Ah, okay, back back to the initial uh, image of the Jesus, 12-year-old Jesus talking to the, uh, the, the elders. And you see, this is this is the one that was repainted four or five years later. It looks less objectionable, but still some people found it objectionable enough. We get the next slide. Yeah, this is the original uh, the original sketch. And you see, the face is a is a more Jewish face, whatever, he's barefoot, he's dressed in a more uh, urchin-like way, and this was truly uh, an abomination to the eyes of people who had a much more idealized uh, image of uh, Jesus uh, and of Jews, inappropriate uh, for, uh, you know, for a painter of this kind of figure. But this is, this is the, uh, the house in the Grisa Place that Lubman lived in on the right, is the Brandenburg Gate, uh, and uh, you can see this is a uh, house of extraordinary, uh, you know, let's say, privilege. Uh, Lieberman was a figure who, in the 1880s and into the 90s, was transgressive. The pressures was transgressive. He belonged, and uh, was actually president of the Berlin Secession. There were secessions, as I'm sure you know, in Vienna, uh, the famous Ulrich building, as some of you may have seen, uh, the Sacra uh, tradition of a kind of a Jugendstil, uh, and uh, also in Munich. The Berlin Secession began really in 1892 with uh, an outcry over the paintings uh, of Edward Munch, and uh, became official in 1898 when it split apart. It was possible to have a secession when uh, there was a market for works of art, and I mentioned the series or others as well, who began uh, basically selling these works outside of official patronage channels, and artists began to benefit from them. Uh, now, for those years, say 1892 or up through maybe 1910, Impressionism was still relatively transgressive. But it is, as I'm sure those of you who know German uh, uh, art history uh, will, uh, will immediately attest, it was soon surpassed by uh, first Expressionism, and then uh, Dada and Zachary, a number of other uh, more modern traditions. Lieberman, on the other hand, remained wedded to the Impressionism uh, of his uh, earliest, uh, or let's say post-realist earliest work. And in fact, became a painter of such established uh, credentials that he was elected the presidency of the Prussian Academy in 1920, and painted figures like President Karl von Hindenburg, 1927. Hindenburg, who right wing president of uh, the Republic of like 25, the Great War hero, uh, and Lieberman is his painter. So you see a guy who really has uh, cozied up, we might say, to the establishment is the figure who represents a kind of uh, powerful tradition. Now, I want to also, though, still see him as transgressive in 
comparison to the official tradition. This is painted by Anton von Werner uh, in the uh, 1890s of, uh, an, uh, of a, uh, the opening of Parliament, the opening of the Reichstag by the Kaiser. And this is a traditional um, a history painting, very realistic in a kind of uh, idealized way. Uh, the opposite of that, on the left and out of eye, the opposite of the uh, more, uh, uh, you know, let's say, less formal brushwork of someone like, uh, uh, like Lieberman. So this was uh, the painting of the Kaiser and the officials of the uh, Kaiserreich approved of. Uh, Lieberman was an outsider in relation to someone like Van Werner, Van Werner uh, attacked him, as did many uh, of the people around the Kaiser. This is typical of the work that, uh, that Lieberman did around the same time. Uh, but once again, you see now a sort of shift away from poor people or modest people, we might say. These are, you know, fairly uh, upper class or at least upper middle class riders by the ocean. You see the style very impressionistic, but the subject matter is not in any way transgressive, it's not in any way uh, you know, realistic in the sense of, say, Millet's Greeners or other paintings from an early period, Courbet's uh, Stonebreakers and so forth. These are people enjoying the leisure uh, of, of the time. And the Impressionists, to some extent, uh, became identified with that kind of, uh, of work. This is another painting that he did uh, of a cafe, uh, when sees almost echoes of Renoir. Uh, once again, upper middle class, or at least middle class leisure, uh, very far from the busyness of Berlin life, very far from uh, the, uh, uh, in a way, transgressions, we might say, of uh, aesthetic uh, form that one finds in uh, expressionist or the Neues Uh Now, in the, uh, the house in the Lanza, he became very interested in painting, uh, as we see here, his garden. And one of the models uh, was uh, Monet. This is uh, from Monet's garden in Giverny, and uh, some of you may actually visited it. It's a garden uh, which was the object of many, many of Monet's paintings uh, with extraordinary brilliant color, lots of vibrant uh, movement, lots of, uh, in a way, uh, experiments in the flatness of the canvas and so forth. Uh, and uh, Lieberman, wealthy as he was, in fact, owned many Monet's. He owned Rembrandt's, he owned uh, many other paintings from his own period. Uh, and he took uh, inspiration from Monet. This is another image of one of the, uh, the Monet uh, gardens. Uh, this is uh, uh, Lieberman himself in his own garden. Uh, and you see the sort of bowers behind. Uh, Lieberman lived uh, for extended periods of time uh, in the house of the Villa Alavanze, and the garden became a favorite subject. Uh, he painted something like 200 images from the garden. Uh, this is one of them with that uh, bower behind him. Uh, still impressions, uh, the palette slightly more vivid, slightly. Uh, lighter, but nothing like the ones we just saw with Monet. Um, you see the bonze behind the sailboat and so forth. Uh, in a way, this was a, uh, a refuge, an escape. Uh, escape from the city, escape from uh, the ethnic strife and so forth. This is, these are roses in the garden. Uh, ah. This is one final image, and then I'll stop with uh, the images uh, and actually just talk. Uh, this is a, um, uh, a photograph of the garden as it exists today, at the terrace, the flower terrace that exists today. After the building was reconstituted in 2006 as a museum, they replanted it uh, as uh, more or less uh, the way it You can see the flower beds and the hedges of uh, the garden. Uh, this is uh, one area of it. All right, so enough images. Let me, let me just focus on uh, the, uh, the importance of the garden itself and to see if we can make of that as a theme in, uh, in the work not only of, uh, uh, of uh, living but in uh, art uh, and architectural history in general. I mean, one might say that there are two or three major traditions in the history of landscape architecture which have cultural significance. Uh, the first one, I mean, this is you know, not talking about Chinese or Japanese or Islamic gardens, just in the West. The first tradition we might identify with the formal gardens associated with uh, either the Baroque or the neoclassical age. And think of figures like Lynn Mortimer, who 
was a great uh, uh, landscape architect of Versailles. Gardens that were regular and were filled uh, with uh, statuary that had fountains that shot water into the air and were meant to be seen from uh, a parterre in a great house, so you look down on them. Um, these are gardens that are architectonic. They're construed as, in a way, a continuation of a house, uh, a domestication of nature, but one that allows you to feel as if you are still in control, still very much uh, in uh, an extension of, of uh, a building that captures uh, the uh, control and uh, the uh, order and the symmetry uh, of uh, the world, certainly of neoclassicism. In the uh, early um, uh, 18th century, uh, there was a reaction against uh, these kinds uh, of formal gardens, uh, and basically uh, in England. Uh, for example, the Serpentine, uh, uh, the um, lake that was built uh, by uh, Queen Carolyn under her auspices in England, uh, the uh, regular qualities, circular or oval of traditional water uh, in, uh, a, uh, in a traditional garden uh, became um, uh, deliberately irregular. Uh, and instead of having fountains that shot water up, uh, water was allowed to flow correct to gravity. You always have to between the older gardens, water goes up, these newer gardens, water only follows, nature goes down. Uh, in the hands of people like uh, Kent and Bridgman and Kevin Billy Brown, the garden was changed from a regular, confined, ordered space, an architectonic extension of the house, into a park, uh, into uh, a large area that was meant to be uh, picturesque, uh, meant not to be seen from the parterre of the house, but walked through. Uh, the English garden, this was called, uh, romantic in certain respects, a garden that uh, we associate with a uh, much less regular, much less ordered, much less dominating version uh, of the control of nature. Now, in fact, these gardens were just as artificial. Uh, the water may have gone down rather than up, but nonetheless, uh, the serpentine was created by moving the earth, and the trees were pruned, and uh, the work that was uh, done, uh, agricultural work, was not allowed to interfere with the actual garden because there were what were called ha-has that uh, prevented animals from crossing uh, these are sort of ditches that uh, were built. So this was also, in a way, artificial. Uh, it was construed basically as a different kind of artifice, but nonetheless uh, artificial. In the early 20th century, actually begins in the 19th, but in Germany, in the early 20th century, a reaction against both of these uh, uh, took place. In Germany, there had been uh, the uh, traditional gardens, uh, both kinds. For example, at the Sans Souci Palace of uh, Frederick the Great in Potsdam, uh, well, there were several different versions of the garden. There was a regular Versailles like garden. Uh, but uh, in the 19th century, Linné uh, and others created parks in the English style. In fact, in Munich, there is an English garden, and the, the English garden, which is built on English uh, garden uh, uh, models. Uh, in the area that we're talking about on the Banze, the so-called Fallon Insel, or the island, the Peacock Island, also uh, built by Lene as if it were an English garden. In uh, the early 20th century, a reaction against both styles emerged in Germany. And the major figure here is a guy named Billy Lange. There were others, uh, named Beat, uh, Beat Kings, uh, Jürgen Spahn, uh, several others who were also illustrative of this style. And what made this uh, style particularly um, uh, fraught was an attempt to restore the what you might call uh, biologically native uh, qualities of the landscape, to get rid of the artificiality, to go back to nature, uh, to let uh, the uh, garden be not a continuation of the house, but a continuation of the forest, a continuation uh, of something, sort right, of jungle or wilderness, something outside of human control. Um, uh, examples of this, one of the, sim the symptoms of this was an attempt to get rid of uh, non-native plants, uh, to get rid of plants that were seen as intruding. Now, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, with uh, the explorations that occurred, uh, beginning with Captain Cook, botanists went abroad and came back and brought back various samples. So I read uh, one estimate in 1750, a European garden had about 1,000 species to choose from. Uh, in 1850, there were 20,000. 100 years later, God knows how many, uh, all over the world. And uh, as a result, the gardens were filled with plants that were non-native. And so Lana and company tried to 
uh, purge, we might say, German gardens of these unnatural French and English influences on natural flowers and mustard. Now, this may sound familiar. It sounds a bit like our attempt to get rid of invasive species and to worry about ecological balance. And there's a bit of that that we can see in history. It also, however, had a very sinister side. So there's an idea of a German landscape, a German garden, which connect very soon to the blood and boat of blood and earth or blood and soil ideology of Nazism. That what you got rid of were not only uh, you know, the, the, the sort of foreign plants, but also allegedly foreign peoples. So what we might see as a botanical version of ethnic cleansing takes place. And it's not by chance that Longa became a Nazi and that uh, 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 Jürgen Spahn was in fact the main Nazi architect landscaper who uh, hoped to do uh, German uh, gardens of this kind uh, in Poland and elsewhere uh, where Leibniz traveled allowed the Germans to settle in the East. He actually had a career after World War II as well. Uh, it's one of those uh, stories of continuity to Nazism and what happened there. Now, all right, what about someone like Liebman? Well, the Liebman garden was, pla was planned in a way in opposition to Lana. Uh, this is not the natural garden, and not just native plants. He brings in species from elsewhere. Uh, there are Mexican and Tahonians, there's uh, geraniums and Pelagonia from the Mediterranean, lots of different kinds of flowers. And also, as we see in the image that we have here, the garden, and also the one here, uh, there is a certain return to regularity, a certain return to uh, hedges, I mean, the great uh, enemy of both Longa and of the uh, landscape architect uh, uh, of Lenné was the hedge, which was too much like uh, a wall in a room. Uh, and one has a sense of control and regularity rather than uh, the spontaneity uh, of the Lama Garden. Uh, and there are several other figures during this period uh, who are also uh, present in this kind of restoration of a more historically variable garden. Now, there were birch trees on the side. There was a certain, let's say, irregularity as well. But this is a much more eclectic garden. And one might say that in this garden, one has um, a symbol of the uh, German-Jewish faith in Bildung, in the cultivation uh, of uh, the uh, wilderness within as well as without, the belief that somehow one can uh, live a life of order and control in which beauty is uh, elevated to a certain kind of uh, human proportion and balance. Very much like the um, uh, old tradition that goes back to Winkelmann, uh, 18th century Germany, uh, of uh, a kind of um, let's say, neoclassical order, which uh, is not going to be uh, you know, allowed to descend into chaos. Now, the great irony, of course, is that uh, he is trying to restore this version of the garden at a time when it is uh, very much under pressure. And it seems to me the image of the painting we have here shows a bit of that, because the colors in it, the flowers, uh, are very vibrant, very, uh, in a sense, out of control, and yet we still have the geometrical form. So there is a kind of tension in the painting itself uh, between the, uh, the sort of explosion that uh, is about to happen. Karl Schorsky, in his famous book on Fantasy after Vienna, finishes with a chapter called Explosion in the Garden, where he talks about uh, the original aesthetic garden, very popular in the late 19th uh, and early 20th century Austria, and then uh, uh, Oscar Kokoschka's uh, expressionist art, in which there is uh, a sense of the chaos that descends, the repression <coughs> no longer succeeding, sublimation no longer succeeding. There's a little bit of that here, but not fully exploded. But alas, Liebermann lives a couple of years too long. He dies in 1935, two years after the Nazis come to power. Uh, and he's disgraced. His, uh, his paintings are removed from museums. He's no longer the head of the Prussian uh, Academy. Uh, and he dies, um, uh, you know, in, in uh, very much uh, uh, in, in a moment of uh, extraordinary crisis for the German Jews of his day. One that is extended, alas, five years later when his wife, his widow Martha, uh, is forced to sell the house and uh, is about to be sent to Theresienstadt, the concentration camp, uh, and then commits suicide. So the story is one of extraordinary rise of a kind of hope for German Jewish symbiosis, of the belief in the possibility uh, of finding order amidst chaos, of uh, making a garden out of a wilderness, of finding escape from 
uh, reality uh, of somehow, uh, in a way, um, you know, we might say placating uh, the gods. Uh, a desire to do that and ultimately a failure. I want to finish uh, just by uh, giving you some lines from a very different figure from this period. He nonetheless thought seriously about uh, the images uh, of, uh, uh, of the garden. This is uh, uh, Bertolt Brecht. Uh, Brecht, who, that's a different generation, um, very, very certainly never met, but nonetheless uh, himself a uh, victim of Nazism. He, uh, was able to go to the United States and escape, but nonetheless uh, was an exile. And let me just finish with a couple of lines from the poem that he wrote for the Garden in Congress. Now, this is a poem that refers to a garden that he knew quite well here in California, uh, a garden in Southern California that was owned by the actor uh, Charles Lawton. And as I'm sure many of you know, he and Lawton worked together uh, on the play The Galileo, uh, which uh, Brecht wrote. Lawton was the first figure in it. And it's a long poem, I'll just read you a few lines. High above the Pacific coast, below it the waves gentle thunder and the rumble of oil tankers lies the actor's garden. So, you know, we get the rumble of oil tankers. Uh, there's a reality that uh, is beginning to uh, emerge. And he goes on describing different uh, parts of the garden. In one place he says, in the corner uh, come the fir trees, against the wall you come on the fuchsias. Like immigrants, the lovely bushes stand unmindful of their origin, amazing themselves with many a daring red, their full of bloom surrounding the small, indigenous, strong, and delicate undergrowth of dwarf Calacanthus. Fuchsia is like immigrants. In other words, precisely what the really lies in the world were trying to expel, this garden welcomes uh, flowers like fuchsias that are not native uh, to California. Uh, the immigrants' garden. But, alas, uh, it's fragile. The poem ends with this stanza. The last lovely garden placed high above the coast that is built on crumbling rock. Landslides drag parts of it into the depths without warning. Seemingly, there's not much time left in which to complete it. So a sense of the fragility of the garden, a sense of the garden being undermined from below, the garden being a momentary respite uh, from the waves that are about uh, to claim it. Uh, and the ways symbolic or otherwise that claim Max Lieberman uh, and uh, his wife uh, living, alas, too long beyond the moment of the German Jewish Parnassus. Okay, thanks, and thanks for enduring it. Towards impressions, that was the style he stayed with. He became the impressions. 
Uh, there are other German impressions. I mentioned Louis Kuhn, uh, there was also Max Slayhoff. Not uh, high figures in the pantheon of 20th century German art. Mostly, uh, you know, they're solid, known in Germany, but did not have the international reputation. French painting has an impact in Germany. German painting does not have a significant impact in France. Yeah. Marty, I want to ask you a little bit about Liebermann's Jewishness. Yes. Uh, you make the point that he did not exhibit as much, uh, certainly in his paintings. And I'm just wondering to what extent he saw himself as Jewish. Because this is that Jesus and the elders painting, uh, he obviously felt he needed to redo it mm -hmm. because of the initial right. uh, hostile reaction. But of course, the scene itself, uh, if, uh, the, if that, there's the story, the Testament tale, that Jesus and the, the Jewish elders outdoing, outstripping right. the Jewish elders, this is not a particularly Jewish kind right. of subject. Right. In fact, that, that's why I was wondering why there would be a hostile reaction right. by the establishment. Well, I think it's because he's treading on the territory just by doing a picture of Jesus that is not an idealized picture, not a devotional picture. I mean, there are, most of the images of Jesus, uh, I would say, are meant for devotional purposes. There are churches, there are altarpieces, they're meant to have the aura, we might say, of something that's more than just a realistic portrayal. So we might say that this version of Jesus is like the life of Jesus that Strauss is writing in the middle of the 19th century. It's intended to historicize to make Jesus a person to make him a kid, you know, with uh, dirty feet and, uh, you know, sort of arguing. You know, and so it, it's an attempt to bring Jesus down to earth entirely, to, uh, to get rid of that divine spark. Now, he does apparently do some, and I've never actually seen pictures of this, some scenes of Simon and Delilah, so there's some, maybe not actual paintings, but perhaps sketches, but otherwise the Bible is not part of his repertoire. He was, however, sort of very interested in Rembrandt. Now, Rembrandt is a very, very fascinating figure in the late 19th century. There is an attempt to Germanize Rembrandt. There's Julius Longmain's famous book, Jewel, Rembrandt Alcet Seer, Rembrandt is educated, which tries to make him into an Aryan uh, progenitor of a certain German cultural tradition. There were uh, people trying to push back and who remembered that Rembrandt was, in fact, a significant uh, figure in uh, the Amsterdam Jewish community. He painted a lot of rabbis and whatever, and lived in that part of Amsterdam. And when he went to Amsterdam working with Joseph Israel, he took uh, Rembrandt to heart and understood Rembrandt's role in that sense. So in a way, there's a kind of battle over the uh, legacy or the interpretation of Rembrandt, and he's part of that. Uh, my understanding is that he never considered um, uh, a, con a conversion. You know, this is not like the Mendelssohn family or other families, or I think we're going to get there, you know, what Heine called entry to uh, European civilization. He knew he was a Jew, he knew that he was you know, understood by other people as a Jew. There was no attempt to sort of deny that. Uh, and there are some places, he had a very interesting discussion with uh, Richard Daymond, his friend, the letters that we have where he talks about what it meant to be a Jewish painter. Daymond was Gentile, but they talk about what it means to be a Jewish painter. He's not so sure that he's that. He says, I'm a painter first. You know, Jews can paint too, but you know, there's also a Jewish painter. So he's very interested in figuring it out. It's not as if he ignores it, but it doesn't come thematized in the work. I mean, he's not, you know, Chagall or something like that. This is a very different uh, take on that. So it's uh, maybe you can call it self-delude, you know, self-delusion, that he could somehow assimilate uh, and German Jews would be able to uh, sort of live lives that would be increasingly prosperous, increasingly uh, included in the higher uh, echelons, not only business, but also art, and maybe ultimately in politics. Um, and then, of course, as I say, he lived a few years too long and discovered that was a high Do you ever think that the, uh, I don't want to monopolize this, but that the uh, hostile reaction to that the pain of Jesus and the elders was not possibly so much, what, in your view, when, uh, rightly, that turned Jesus into a kind of ragged, but rather, did Jesus look too Jewish? Well, in the sketch, in the sketch, maybe he looks too Jewish. I said that the nose is a little more prominent. Uh, the hair is dark rather than blonde. And the fact that he changes Jesus to a blonde, you know, from, from the Middle East, shows that he's trying to appease them, basically. 
Now, it doesn't work. I mean, the painting, it's a, the, the, the painting that we have is a retouch painting from, I think, 1884. It, it doesn't work. I mean, he never exhibits it uh, again until, I think, something like 1908, one of the Berlin So for a long period of time, it was still toxic. And uh, it's quite amazing to see the extent to which he is stigmatized with the Casiras and others as introducing foreign, cosmopolitan, non-German elements into German uh, high art. I mentioned Anton von Weber. Weber was not an anti-Semite, was actually a reasonable liberal, but he also pushed back. And the Kaiser was very clear. The Kaiser finally loses around 1980 to the Telegraph Affair. He loses the kind of, uh, you know, let's say, power because of his role in the company with the British newspaper, the Telegraph. But anyway, for many, many generations, uh, two or three generations from you know, his uh, kind of power. He plays, he plays a role as an arbiter of culture, fights back against, uh, you know, uh, uh, Chudi, who was the head of the uh, great museums in Berlin, against uh, Von Bodo. I mean, there's an attempt really to, in a way that we would now find very intrusive, for the head of the government to dictate a cultural policy. And that's why you have to have a secession, because within the academy, you're in the establishment. Uh, order that there's still no room for even these relatively you know, mild transgressions that are represented. Yeah, sure. I'm wondering about the relationship between uh, Lieberman and Monet, because they're pretty much contemporary. Right. Uh, Monet dies two years after this painting. Uh, you mentioned that Lieberman did a couple of hundred paintings right. in the garden. Uh, so they had a very common focus and common interest and common common genre, right. uh, did they have an ongoing relationship? I, I'm pretty sure that they did. I mean, now how close it was, I couldn't say. But Liebman spent a lot of time in France. I was five years old. Mostly at the Barbizon School, in L.A. and people like that, uh, I think in the 18, probably uh, 70s, early 70s. Uh, but he certainly collected and uh, I'm sure had interactions, uh, personal and otherwise, with, uh, uh, with many of the impressions. I think he perhaps was the one that they took seriously enough to see as part of their company. Now, ultimately, uh, Monet certainly, uh, you know, Monet, Monet, a much more uh, daring, experimental, uh, and more original painters. I think Liebman is, in some basic sense, the way, you know, uh, Slavo and Clarence, in most respects, were as well. These are not the shining stars of our, uh, let's say, uh, MoMA version of modernism, which begins, you know, basically with Manet, and it goes through a French trajectory, not a German trajectory, until expressions. And it is interesting that he doesn't have his own human show, the way he comes Vienna, this, he doesn't have a symbolist side, there are other German symbolists, I mean, there really is a kind of national focus. So, uh, I think to that extent, he's part of the impressionist world, and knows Manet, and collects Manet, but it doesn't extend, Manet is not learning from him. Uh, German Jewish uh, 
uh, to build it, uh, and still in Spurgeon, uh, cultivated Jews. Um, I don't think he ever expressed, as far as I know, German Jewish hostility to us Jews. You know, there isn't in his work a kind of nastiness towards uh, people of other uh, strata. Uh, he's enough of a Zionist to, um, to donate one of his paintings to the uh, Bezalel Arts and Crafts Museum in Jerusalem, and it's founded in the, in the 1920s. So he's able to sort of take in, you know, into account the fact that he is seen as a hero by other Jews, as you know, a successful Jew. Uh, one of his uh, second cousins was Walter Rotman, who was the, uh, the uh, foreign minister before he was assassinated by the Semite Stalin twenty-three. So you know, he's part of a, I mentioned Arnold and like her, part of a, uh, a group of people mingled with the powerful and who had uh, you know, enough uh, the ear of the powerful. They felt that they were you know, the cutting edge of the new German-Jewish success story. And uh, you know, it's very hard not to feel the irony of the last uh, two years of his life and the last seven of his wife's life committing suicide on route to the So. And when you're there, and it's so beautiful. Right. Yeah, it, it, it's an overwhelmingly uh, poignant uh, trajectory. You know, these, uh, and I'm sure there are other villas around that also have stories to, you know, to tell. Uh, most of them not destroyed during the war, repurposed. Uh, I mean, after they took over his house, it became a post office, uh, the right, the, the right postal service, and the uh, very, you know, the took the American army. So, so there are various other things that occurred over the years. Uh, Is a memorial that's featured in it? Well, there are some of his paintings. Uh, there, there are various um, you know, video movies of, of his life. Uh, the garden's been redone. How much of the original furniture? I'm not 100% sure, but I imagine it brought back some of it. So, you know, like a lot of these um, places that were houses, they become museums as well as houses. And, uh, you know, uh, it takes what, a good hour or so to go through it. There's beautiful terrace and Right. Right. And the Right. Right. Uh, no, it's, it's, very it's a modest house. I mean, it's very beautiful, but it's very modest. Yeah, it's not a palace. He called it his castle on the lake, but it really it's the summer house. I mean, the Grisa Plaza house, that I briefly showed, that, which I never actually visited, I'm not sure if it was a body or anything, was a grand house, uh, a grand urban house, you know, like one of these Fifth Avenue palaces that we associate with the uh, bourgeoisie of New York. Uh, but this was a summer house, so maybe three months during the year or whatever. I mean, at, at this time, the bonsai was a significant distance away. You know, it was, it was, uh, an hour and a half to get there. Yeah. Uh, can you speak of the tremendous tension between the um, Lieberman and the German society? Well, you know, there are lots of uh, subcurrents. The secession, for example, has its own secession. Uh, Lieben gets fed up with it um, and gives up uh, the uh, directorship for a while. Uh, I think that, I mean, I, I'm not sure precisely what you're alluding to, but there are lots of moments when there are different attempts to create uh, the avant garde or cutting edge, whatever you want to call it. And Lieben is, I think, a relatively tolerant figure. And I mentioned Van Berner and others who really were guardians who said, no, this is art, that's garbage. This is high art. That's kitsch, or whatever the kind of negative term would be. Liebman, as far as I know, didn't attack expressionism. He was not a vocal uh, opponent of the noise optic kind of thing. I'm pretty sure that's right. And he continued to do what he did. So uh, these are you know, probably power struggles, probably struggles over, I guess, cultural things. Are you thinking of anything in particular? Or? Well, but what's fascinating is that uh, there's a battle within, I mean, I mentioned von Werner. Von Werner was actually not anti-Semitic. He was an ally of the Kaiser, but not anti-Semitic. So the currents go back and forth. It's not, uh, there are other um, examples of Jews who attack leading like the blue in German art. So it gets, it gets more complicated than simply lining up you know, traditional uh, political figures, traditional cultural figures, anti-Semitic. It gets much more complicated than that. Uh, it's an interesting intersection of various things. And you know, he was a great painter during the First World War. Uh, he painted a number of things that were uh, 
Cold War and the signing of the Defense Manifesto of the 93 in uh, 1914, defending German cultural values and seeing the war as a, you know, somehow a battle not of armies, but a battle of ideas. So, you know, he was on the side of uh, uh, a certain version of German patriotism. And we would have felt the German Jews were, you know, as patriotic, even more so perhaps, because they, you know, uh, emerged only when they united Germany, uh, and created the space for uh, their success. Yeah? Uh, in reference to the, the explosive nature of the, right. of the painting of the garden, I'm, I'm wondering if you could see a connection between that and sort of like a, a quietly tumultuous relationship with, uh, with bourgeoisie. Mm -hmm. in, in, and, and I think it's a feature that you may have encountered a lot in the intellectual artistic figures you study. Uh, so if you could spend a word about this sort of both comfortable uh, world, but also very disquieting at the same time. Well, we often have an image of the artist in Garrett who is, uh, you know, both uh, transgressive in aesthetic terms and also culturally hostile uh, to bourgeois values and uh, doesn't like the art market. They may get away from the old patriotic system, but doesn't like, I guess, to sell his work in the current market. Now, someone like Liebenbach is outside that because he's a man of privilege. He doesn't have to sell his work. He's already wealthy. He never lives in a garret. Uh, he may have some trouble with anti-Semites, but they don't bring him down until 1933. So he himself is a figure who uh, is able to uh, somehow assimilate into the Bildungsburger Club. Because his father was part of the Zitzburger Club, the bourgeoisie of possession of the bourgeoisie of culture, and feel that you know he could somehow move up with the sublimation uh, of uh, cultures or the culture of uh, building and not feel alien. So I think, you know, you think of artists also, that's the cliche word, is alienated. Uh, Lieberman is not an alienated figure. You know, this, this is a guy who is successful in almost every regard until about the end of his life. So I think to that extent, these gardens are symbols of a certain complacency, the negative, but, but a certain sort of feeling of comfort, a feeling of belonging, a feeling not of being uh, a, uh, an outlaw. Uh, when you get in the Expressionist movement, there's much more a sense of pain, of agony, of uh, extreme emotions, of feelings of deep alienation, of feelings that uh, the culture had let them down, that high culture is a fraud, that basically what they had to do is to reinvent it. And so the primitivism you find in, say, paintings like Nolder, there's nothing but remotely primitivist in anything he does. There's no attempt to sort of re-energize the world by getting in touch with primal feelings. There's no even psychoanalytic moment of you know, whatever you want to call uh, a certain uh, psychological uh, intensity that one finds in some of the other figures of this period. Nor is there uh, the coldness, the sense of uh, identification with technological, maybe even technological sublime, when you find the noise occupied, in which you know, there's a kind of cynicism. There's no cynicism. So there's none of that sense of uh, I'm going to be, you know, basically uh, able to outsmart the world by not playing the law. He plays the law. He doesn't. He doesn't uh, try to separate himself from that world. I mean, Brecht is a great example of a kind of cynicism. Brecht goes through a kind of uh, noise off and kind of phase. And it's much more uh, alienated because he uses the alienation effect in his own work. You never find that. There's no bearing of the device. There's no reflexivity about what the artist is doing. There's no reflexivity about the institution of art in, in Lieberman's actual practice. Uh, he's comfortable, more comfortable perhaps than he would like him to have been, but you know, I think that's accurate as an expression of who he really was. Basically, a uh, more comfortable figure. Whereas a lot of other German artists are in period of feeling the pressure of the need to be political. I mean, is he political? Well, he's a kind of liberal. Uh, but, you know, he's able to sort of play along with people. You know, I mean, you, you can't imagine Beo Gross doing a portrait uh, of uh, Hindenburg. He's put that one. Well, you could, but you could. But wouldn't you want Hindenburg to sit still once we're done? Francesco, do you assess how the language became an obsession with this particular painting? Yes, but uh, it's mainly an be another story. So I don't want to give everything away <laughs> this time. 
we uh, we're extremely grateful to to Mark and Jake for for joining us. We shake hands. started out of the catalog of the forum, right. and you do get another copy as, oh, a, as, as a token of your participation, so I, 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 won't, I won't run and get it for you, it's right here. But thank you again so, so much. Uh, you know, you, you may wait for an okay gift here. Oh, this is your official second copy of the book, and this is how we started this conversation. Oh,